Some of you may remember, like sometime back in a previous sermon, I mentioned the oral history project called StoryCorps. StoryCorps is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide Americans of all backgrounds and beliefs the opportunity to record and share the stories of their lives. Recently, I listened again to the interview of Rowena Gore Simmons by her teenage daughter. Kenya Gore was just four years old when her mother, a recovering drug addict, was incarcerated for theft, and Kenya wanted to ask about her mother's time in prison. In this interview, Kenya asked her mother, Rowena, what was your first night like in prison? Rowena responds, I was being shackled, hands and feet. I was disappointed in myself, and I was scared for you guys. Kenya asks, what did you think about while you were there? And Rowena replies, well, it made me really think about life, and I asked myself, who are you and who do you want to be? I wanted to be a better mother and learn more about being a mom. I wanted to hold you. I wanted to count your fingers. I wanted to brush your hair. I wanted to be with you. Kenya asked, what was the best part of being out of prison? And Rowena responds, that I have my family. This is what I'm living for, to be a family. Are you different, Kenya asks. And Rowena says, Oh, God, you know, sometimes I look back at the past and I say to myself, who was that person? And I thank you for being patient with me. And I thank you for still loving me and for giving me the opportunity to be your mother. Then Rowena asked her daughter a question. What do you hope for the future? And Kenya responds, that we never get split apart again and that we stay together forever. Rowena says, you are so special to me, and I will always be by your side. I love you. I love you too. This is a story of reconciliation. This is a story of repentance and forgiveness, the mending of broken relationships and the healing of the pain of separation. The story of Rowena and Kenya is a modern-day version of that ancient parable of the prodigal son, except that maybe in this case it's the story of the prodigal mother. And this story reveals the power of this holy work of reconciliation to restore relationships and give new life. This Sunday is the fourth Sunday of Lent. And traditionally, this Sunday is known as Letare Sunday, also known as Rose Sunday, and it marks a halfway point in Lent. The Sunday provides a bit of a break in the austerity of Lent and is a day of hope, with Easter now on the horizon. In our reading of the second letter to the Corinthians, Paul writes powerfully and beautifully of the power of reconciliation that is our Rose Sunday message of hope. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has been made new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation has the power to heal relationships, to soothe wounds, to repair breaks, to reconnect us to ourselves and to each other and to God, our source of life and meaning. The incarnation, ministry, death, and resurrection of Christ was an act of love through which God reconciled ourselves to him. And in that reconciliation, we become a new creation that reflects the righteousness of God. There is our Christian hope. And there is the good news of Jesus. In giving us the ministry of reconciliation, we are called to imitate the God we believe in. 
As God ever extends the grace of forgiveness to us, we are called to do the same with each other. And the parable of the prodigal son shows us the magnificent power that is unleashed when reconciliation happens. Rather than rejected, the son is excitedly met, embraced, and kissed. Before he can even finish his apologetic greeting, he is joyfully restored to the family. The repentant son has become a new creation, and the father rejoices that this son of mine who was dead is alive again. He was lost and is found. Conversely, in this parable, Jesus also shows the suffering we endure when we cut someone off and refuse to forgive, refuse to reconcile. When the elder son heard about the return of his brother, he became angry and refused to go inside and join in the celebration. More than just being resentful and a killjoy, his rejection of reconciliation also had deeper repercussions. His refusal to mend a broken relationship with his brother results in the breaking of relationship with his father as well. To refuse reconciliation is to refuse relationship. This is a story not just of the healing that results from repentance, but also the pain and damage that is inflicted when forgiveness is denied and reconciliation rejected. Conflict happens. It seems to happen a lot right now. It even seems to be our default human state sometimes. <clears throat> We are practically habituated nowadays to a persistent climate of conflict, anger, resentment, and revenge. Turn on the TV, read the news, go to the movies, and you will begin to see the toxic cloud of our own making in which we live. While resentment and revenge are aspects of our broken human nature, reconciliation, however, is something holy. Something sacred happens when we reconnect, forgive, and restore relationship. We experience a taste of the divine life. The kingdom of God breaks into our lives in those moments. We can see this happen in the parable of the prodigal son. And it looks like a beautiful ring placed on a finger that is scarred and chapped. It looks like a fine, warm robe gently spread across a thin and weary back. It looks like a grieving household, which is now celebrating restored life with a feast of fatted calf and much music and dancing. Through Christ, we are reconciled to God, and we too are able to experience the grace of restoration. With this, however, comes a responsibility to give this gift to others. We are called to imitate the God we believe in. We are to reflect the righteousness of God, so we forgive because we have been forgiven. We love because we have been loved. We seek reconciliation with others because through Christ we have been reconciled to God and entrusted with the message and ministry of reconciliation. Of course, the perennial question then is, well, that's all well and good, but how do I do this? Forgiveness and reconciliation are those topics that are interesting to talk about, but so much harder to actually live out. I know that. It's certainly been true in my life. So I spent some time consulting experts by Googling the word forgiveness. And let me tell you, a lot of people think they have figured this out. For example, I found the following. How to forgive someone when it's hard, 30 steps to let go of anger. How to forgive, 13 steps. Eight steps to biblical forgiveness. And my favorite, how to forgive in three steps. (laughs) It's getting easier and easier with each search result. So I was intrigued that forgiveness might be as simple as three steps, and so I opened up that web page. And would you like to hear what they are? Yes. Okay, ready? One, identify the person you're angry with. That seems like it's pretty easy. (laughs) Two, honestly address your feelings in an effort to purge negativity. Okay. 
three, begin to forgive. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm serious. Begin to forgive. It says, reach for compassion for the person's emotional blindness or cold heart. That's it. That's it. Done. Who knew it could be that simple? Of course, the problem here is I still don't really know how to forgive. That's not really helpful. It's so shallow. What do you do with that? I suspect that this is because reconciliation really isn't something that we can do entirely by ourselves. It's a messy process, and one that requires God's grace in addition to our hard work of honest reflection and facing our hurt and shame. Reconciliation is holy work, and it requires sacred space for the grace of the Holy Spirit. And that just isn't something we can easily sum up in a short list of quick and easy steps. I think that the key to reconciliation lies in our call to imitate the God we believe in and reflect God's righteousness. To forgive as God forgives requires that we love as God loves and that we remain willing to extend the grace of relationship. That is true reconciliation. So perhaps instead of a bulleted list of steps, we look to something less linear for inspiration. Sometimes poetry can provide a clearer lens for discerning the sacred journeys of the heart. The 14th century Persian poet Hafez wrote a poem called With That Moon Language that I think shows what this willingness towards reconciliation may look like. This is what he wrote. Admit something. Everyone you see, you say to them, love me. Of course, you do, not, you do not do that out loud. Otherwise, someone would call the cops. Still, though, think about this. This great pull in us to connect. Why not become the one who lives with a full moon in each eye that is always saying with that sweet moon language what every other eye in this world is dying to hear. Amen.